we most of the time take the spotlight for ourselves to the detriment of the people that are listening to us because uh, what's important is the, that the people will see the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Shall we stand up and let us pray? Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this day that you have given us that in spite, Lord, despite of this circumstances, situations, oh God, you're still allowing us to gather together and worship you in spirit and in truth. May we, Lord, treasure this and understand, O oh God, that gathering together is so important, O oh God, because we can fellowship with each other, we can exhort one another, we can help one another, encourage one another. But most importantly, Lord, worship you all together. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to work in our hearts and our midst, and that you will speak to us, Lord, that we may know what to do in order for us to become a better Christian, that we can show a testimony, Lord, that will let our light so shine before men. As a result, Lord, you will be glorified, because if not for you, there will be no light in us. I pray, Lord, that you forgive us of our sins and make us worthy, Lord, to be a vessel, Lord, of your truth today. Give me, Lord, wisdom and understanding. And those things, Lord, that I lack, please supply, O God, so that all of us will benefit spiritually from the study that we are going to do today. May you be glorified in our midst. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. So we have read Revelations uh, chapter 2 verses 1 to 7 and we will uh, try to study uh, all the uh, verses and uh, if uh, the time will not permit us anyway we will do this as a series by the grace of God that we're going to study about the seven churches in Revelation. So these churches are historical churches meaning to say that they have existed at one time in history. They are churches uh, that are located in the Roman province called Asia, which is uh, geographically known today as Turkey, not the Asia, wherein we are right now. Uh, these seven cities actually are next to uh, each other. It, if you look at the map, it, it's, it's about it's forming a rough circle, wherein if you're, go, if you're a messenger, you can travel to all the seven uh, places in a uh, circular path and you'll be able to reach them and deliver the message that God has given to these churches. And not only that these churches are historical churches, but the uh, letters to these seven churches can also be viewed prophetically. It is as if this is the order or the plan that the book is actually indicating. If you are going to look at Revelations chapter 1 and verse 19, Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, uh, the Lord said to John, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be here after. So, we can see that in this. Uh, Arrangement chapter 1 is about the things that thou hast seen. That's uh, in the past. And then chapters 2 and 3 will be the things which are. And these are the letters of the Lord to the seven churches. The things that are happening now in our churches. And the things which shall be here after. That will be chapters 4 to 22. So chapters 2 and 3 reveal to us the conditions in the church from its inception to the rapture when it started until the time that the church will be taken out of this world we can see that the conditions that happened in in, in our churches all throughout uh, the existence of the church will be seen in these letters that god has given to the seven churches so in other words each church may be seen as representing a different phase in church history. So we can view it that way. 
But we will view this typically. Meaning to say, we're going to study us the things were written to these churches. So we may ask, why only seven churches? But because there are uh, basically many more churches than seven. So why this particular seven churches? Yes, of course, there are many other churches, as we can see in the epistles of the Apostle Paul. If, we, uh, if you have read the epistle, you will see that there are uh, churches in, 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 in other cities, in, uh, in Philippi, in Colossae, in many other places, but why only these seven churches? So other churches could have been chosen, but the Lord chose these seven churches because they represent conditions that have prevailed throughout church history, from the beginning of the church to the end, when the church will be taken out of this world. Any condition of any church in any place at any time may be found here. First, we are going to look at the uh, letter addressed to the church at Ephesus. If for no better reason, because the church at Ephesus is the nearest to the Isle of Patmos, where God has given this letter to uh, John, the beloved. And not only that, but uh, Ephesus is a major city during the time. It was actually called the metropolis of Asia. It is very prosperous that, uh, and, and it is a business center that is situated on the trade route from Rome to the east. Four major cities are connected by major roads to the city of Ephesus. And at the same time, Ephesus was also a center of pagan worship. This is the location of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, known as the uh, Temple of Diana. In this place, they worship Artemis or Diana, and the worship of Diana is uh, characterized by uh, idolatry and immorality. Actually, this is a place where rich people may go in order to satisfy their sexual fantasies. Because in the Temple of Diana or Artemis, there are many... Uh, uh, prophetess that are actually temple prostitutes. And they are the ones that are uh, going to uh, satisfy the desire of these people. The place is also known as the vanity fair of the ancient world. Much like in the Middle East, it's Dubai. Wherein, you know, uh, in the Middle East, uh, they are quite strict, but in Dubai, it is uh, very open. Wherein those uh, people will just go there and do whatever they want to do that they cannot do in other countries in the Middle East. Incidentally, uh, what happened here in Cambodia is because uh, four escort or prostitutes from Dubai were jetted into Cambodia and they were the index uh, patient that caused this uh, February 20 community event. So that is uh, the uh, place that is called Ephesus. But if you will notice, even though Ephesus is a very pagan place, it is, even though it's a very prosperous, prosperous place and an evil place, but God, through the Apostle Paul, planted churches in this place. Amen? We can see that no matter how wicked the place is, the power of God can still be displayed if people are just going to obey God. If you want to know all about these churches, you can read Acts chapter 19 and 20, wherein we can see the, there that the Apostle Paul spent three years establishing the work of God in that place. Also, Timothy labored in that place as uh, he was uh, asked by the Apostle Paul to work there and also ordained elders in that particular place. So we can see that this church had enjoyed the labors of the best and most gifted men you can ever have in the ministry, but no matter how godly and gifted the ministers are, it is not an insurance that the church's spiritual progress will go on. Yes, they have enjoyed a stellar ministry. The Lord reminded them that he was still in control. It is not about the people that are leading. It is not about their talent, but it is about the power of God. He can place people wherever he wants, and he can remove them whenever he wants. 
But you know, sometimes it is easy for the church to become proud and forget that the leaders or the pastors or the teachers, those that are working in the church, are placed there by church as a gift to the church and the Lord can take them away if we are not careful and if we are going to get the glory for ourselves. So Ephesus was a very privileged church, the only church in the New Testament to which two apostles address letters, the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John. But when Paul wrote to the Ephesians or Ephesus, it was the climax of uh, the climax church of the day. But when John, the beloved, wrote after 30 to 35 years to this church, it was then the crisis church of the day. Because God said, I am somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love, in verse number 4. If you're going to study the church at Ephesus, they are known for their love. But now, they have left their first love. So our success today is not a guarantee of our success tomorrow. We have to keep on keeping on. We have to be careful. We have to guard what was given to us by God. And we need to be humble because in the church, only God must get the glory. And everything that we do in the church must be centered in the Lord, around the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This church, if you will notice, have not lost their fundamentalism, but they have lapsed into formalism. They have not quit their fervent laboring. They're actually a toiling, laboring church, but they have left their first love. It is as if the honeymoon was over, and they are now having a great crisis in that church. So let us look at this letter of the Lord Jesus Christ to this church. We will first look at the commendation. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is always gracious. As much as possible, he will always give a commendation to the churches that he established through the uh, people that he used. Actually, in verse number one, it says, There unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Right. You see, the word angel here means messenger. It does not pertain to the, heaven, the angelic host. Because if we're going to study the Bible, there is no place in the Bible or instance in the Bible, especially uh, during the church age, that an angel was given authority or leadership in the church. So therefore, the angel that is mentioned here are the leaders of the church, the pastor, the preachers, the elders, the bishop. And we thank God because maybe this is the only place in the Bible where the pastors are called angels because you know, the pastors are called many other names but at least in this place they were called angels amen so to the angel uh, of the church at Ephesus write this thing saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walk in the midst of the seven golden candlestick so we can see here that the protection of the church and the leader lies in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He has the stars in his hand. He holds the stars. They are protected in the hands of God. They are surrounded and within uh, the close fist of God. We are protected, we are surrounded, and we are encompassed by the care of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's taking care of the leaders and he's taking care of the members of the church. He loved the church, the Bible says, and he gave his life for it. So no matter what happened, we will always see the love of God in the churches or the local churches that he allowed to be established because he established a church for a purpose and I would to God that the reason why IBCSR was established will be achieved so that we can glorify God through our church or through this church. Amen. Not only that, but we can see that he walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. It means that the Lord Jesus Christ must be, uh, he, he, he is uh, very active in the church. Don't you know that the Lord Jesus Christ is always present whenever we are gathering together? That he is always with us 
that even in the Bible it says that his son with them in the church so we can see that the Lord Jesus Christ is active in his church and I look to God that each and every member of our church will also be active because if the time of God was given to the church then I believe that our time must also be given to the church in order to worship him to serve him and to glorify him he is walking in the midst of the church it means that he must be preeminent in our church he must be the center of our church you see most of the time people are having a mistaken idea that the, the reason why the church is growing the reason why the church is strong is because of them because of their ability because of their charisma ladies and gentlemen whatever we may have is only given to us by god it is a tool given to us by god so that we will be able to serve him and glorify him in the church amen so it is about christ it is all about him and not about us but you see power can be addictive popularity is being desired by so many people and sometimes because of success we think that we are the ones doing it i have heard so many people that said if i am going to leave this church then this church will suffer so much this thing gentlemen it is not you it is the god that is using you that matters in the church so even if you can bring so many visitors if you can give much to the church it is not because of you it was given to you by God if God will not allow it you won't be able to do it that's why we must always give the glory to God and Christ must be preeminent in our church he must occupy the central place and then we can see that in verse number two he says I know thy works meaning to say that God knows everything about the church why because he's walking in there He's in the midst of the church. He knows what is going on in the church. We cannot hide anything from God. We may fool people, but we cannot fool God. We may show people our hypocrisy, but we are naked before God. He knows everything. He knows what we're thinking. He knows our motive. And he knows the reason why we are here in the church. And if it is for any other reason than him, then what wherever we're doing is not accepted in the sight of the Lord. So he knows as I, I know thy work he knows that's why he proceeds to give each church an x-ray of its condition an x-ray will reveal what is inside an x-ray will see what is being hidden by people to other people but God will see them all so what did he know about Ephesus okay number one what are the things that he commend them for he commanded them for their selfless and selfless sacrifice. You see, Christianity in the churches at Ephesus is not a spectator sport. They are active. They are in it. They are working in the church. They are ministering. They are laboring and they are doing it in a self-sacrificing way in verse number it says i know thy works and thy labor it means toil it means uh, working to the point of exhaustion that they mean business if they do something if they start something in the church they're going to finish it they are going to to uh, see through it because not only that they they have labor and they have patience so we need to say when they start something even though it may be hard it may take a long time they will see to it that they're going to finish it so they are a laboring toiling church this is a church that is filled with activities there there, there is endurance and perseverance in this church it means that they serve christ with holy sweat rolled down their foreheads as they ministered to his name they are in this way christ-like because the lord jesus christ came not to be ministered unto but to minister and this church is a ministering church amen not only that but they minister under much stress and pressure remember what ephesus is 
It is a pagan city. It is filled with vain people. They are being persecuted because they are doing things against the most popular personality in that place, and that is Diana, whom they believe came from heaven uh, and went there, in, 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 and, and they made him their God. They worship him. So when they do things against what people believe that Diana want them to do, definitely they will be persecuted and they will be pressured by these people. But despite of that, they minister no end under pressure. So this is a, a, what the Lord Jesus Christ commended about this church. They, they're feeding the poor. They're not lazy. That is one thing that you will not see at the church in Ephesus. But there are churches where, in, uh, where the, the Apostle Paul says that if they will not work, they must not eat. They will not eat. Because there are just churches where, where people are, 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 are lazy. So Ephesus is a church that is really commendable because of the work that they have shown, because of the activity, because of the ministering that they are doing. They have good deeds, selfless toil, uh, long days, draining hours, exerting themselves to the point of exhaustion in serving the Lord. So they propagate the gospel. They see to it that they are obeying the Lord in the commands that God has given them. Not only that, but they are what we call very strict when it comes to uh, the moral condition of the church. Because it says here, How thou canst not bear them which are evil. So if there are members of the church that are not behaving or committing sin, they will confront them with love and help them to, again, go to the right path. So they, they, they do not allow sin to just go freely without being confronted in that church. They do not want the, the, the members to be saints on Sunday and to be ains from Monday to Saturday. Hindi yung disco po kapag kalinggo. And then disco, lunes hanggang sabado. They see to it that members are adhering to the strict standard of morality that God has given them. I believe that there is discipline in this church. That they are not going to tolerate those things that are doing evil and they will see to it that they confront them and if they're not going, if they will repent, they will be restored. If they will not repent, then they will be disciplined to the point of being excommunicated from the church because they will not just allow them to do things that are not according to the standard of God. And then the Lord said, And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. So we can see that they are also very sound when it comes to doctrine. And you cannot just go to the church at Ephesus, stand behind the pulpit, and preach wrong doctrine. You will be caught by these people. They can smell a heretic or a false teacher one mile away from the church. They will talk to you. Maybe they will interview you. You say, hey, I'm an apostle. I'm going to speak in the church. And they will talk to them. And they will test them. And they will find out that they are not real apostles. That they are false teachers. So they won't be able to stand behind the pulpit of this church. And propagate their wrong teaching. You will remember that, that the apostle Paul, before he left Ephesus, in Acts chapter 20 and 29, he warned them. Look at verse 28, and then we will read verse 29 in Acts 20. Take it therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. So that is the importance of the church, the importance of the leaders of the church, the importance of their job. For I know, Paul says, this is sure, this will happen. It is not a matter of if, but it is just a matter of when. For I know that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So at the beginning, they are so 
uh, strict when it comes to allowing people to come to the casement. Maybe some were along the way, something happened that they became lax and they were infiltrated by this false teaching that uh, resulted into the demise of the church over there at Ephesus. But they call a spade a spade. They call black as black, white as white. They do not tolerate error or theological error in the church. If a false teacher will try to uh, penetrate them, then they're going to find them out and they're, going, they're not going to allow them to uh, destroy the church. So they're strict and they are sound when it comes to doctrine. So we can see that this is the uh, uh, like, like the paramount of orthodox, orthodoxy during the time. Like it is the, the, uh, uh, like the place where the truth is being lifted up. It is like a fortress for the faith. Is this important? Yes, it is very important because a church that stands for nothing is going to fall, fall for anything. That's why there must be a standard in every church. There must be doctrinal soundness in every church. There must be moral standard in, in, in every church because if not, then the devil will have a free time, a heyday in destroying that particular church. So like the foundation of a house, theological correctness provides stability, strength, and longevity to a church. But you know, sometimes the world will say, well, you're so too judgmental, you are like this, and you are like that. Well, the, the, the scripture says, test the spirit, and the scripture says, prove all things, and hold fast to that which is good. So it is the job of the church to guard its doctrinal purity and high moral standard that God has given them. Amen. So they were commanded because of this. And not only that, in verse number 3, it says that, And has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. So they're steadfast in what they're doing. You know what the Apostle Paul says? Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord. So this is the church. They're steadfast. They, what they have started, as I've said a while ago, they're continuing. And they have patience. And for the, the name of the sake of the Lord, they labored and has not fainted. No matter how hard it is, they keep on keeping on. They kept on keeping on. They served God. Even under these hard circumstances. So, if we're going to, to look at it, we can see that uh, uh, this church at Ephesus has many good, the Lord has many good things to say to this church. They were hard workers. They were perseverers. They were condemners of wicked men. They were identifiers of false apostles. They, in, they are endurers of hardships. And the Lord says they did not grow weary in well-doing. So they are applying what they have heard from the Apostle Paul. And yet, and yet, in verse number 4, there is an accusation given to them by God. And the accusation is, thou was left thy first love. So how can that be possible? How can you say that they do not love the Lord when they are laboring? How can you say that they do not love the Lord or they have left their first love when they are laboring with much, pa much patience, when they are defending the faith? When they are uh, not, not becoming uh, faint in serving the Lord. Can a church like this, filled with activities, filled with good programs, doing, uh, if you will look at it, almost everything for the Lord to the point of exhaustion. How can we say that this church have lost their first step? And not only that, 
As I have said, they are known to be alive in church. Look at Ephesians 1, 15 to 16. This is the letter of the apostle Paul to them. Paul says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints. This is a loving church. This is a church known for their faith and known for their love. And this is when the world looks at them. Even at this time, when the world will look at the church at Ephesus, they will say, My, what a loving church! But in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, He says, I am somewhat against thee. Thou hast left thy first love. Listen, it is possible to be present in the worship service without loving God. It is possible to be active in every part of the ministry of the church without loving God. It is very much possible to give without loving. It is very much possible to sacrifice even yourself without love. And that is what the Lord Jesus Christ says. And it is said in our days today that many churches are filled with activities but they are devoid of love. Pastor, do you know any of that? Well, I was once in a church like that. We are filled with activities. We win so many souls by the grace of God. We invite so many people. We are even uh, uh, called before as one of the fastest growing church. And yet, the Lord is not glorified. Why? Because we are doing all of those things for accolade and not for the glory of God. So it is very much possible that you are active. It is very much possible that you are doing all of these things. But it is also very much possible that there is no love in the things that we are doing for the Lord. They have mistaken concern for compassion. They have mistaken case of life for commitment to Christ. And they have mistaken ceremonialism for consecrated service. They had retained purity of doctrine and purity of life. They had maintained a high level of service, yet the deep devotion for Christ was not there anymore. It's just like, like husband and a wife. You've been together for, at the beginning. You see the, 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 the devotion, the sweetness, the love, and all of these things. And then as the years go by, things are becoming routine. And then you will, you will feel or you will see that things are not the same anymore. But you're still providing. But you're still going home every day. But you're still doing your duties and your responsibilities. But all of this just became routine. And there is no more devotion in the things that we're doing anymore. It is like you're still together but you're actually apart. This is a very famous illustration. Uh, the, a couple inside a car. The man is driving. At the beginning of their relationship, they're very close to each other. They're sitting beside each other. And then after a few years, the wife said that, I've noticed that we're not uh, uh, close. I, I noticed that before you even, while you're driving, you are putting your, your arms around my shoulder. Not, not anymore. And then the husband said, well, I do not know what happened, but I'm still here driving. I did not move an inch. You're the one who moved away. Our God is a constant God. Our God is a faithful God. He will always be in his place. The person is this. Have we moved away? Have we drifted away? You see, sometimes we can see that we are still doing the same thing. And that's enough. But what's enough is that we are doing things because we love the Lord. Amen? And love is the only acceptable motive in serving the Lord. No matter what we do, without love, then that is nothing before God. Amen? So let us ask ourselves several questions so that we can see if we still have that first love or we have lost that first love like what the Lord Jesus Christ uh, have against the churches at Ephesus. Question, are we still dedicated to the Lord? Is our lives still dedicated to God? The word dedicated means consecrated to a sacred purpose 
or the act of devoting oneself to another. Let us go to Romans 12, 1 and 2. This is what Paul says. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice and consecration, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Why is it acceptable? Because it is in tune with God. It is, because it is uh, uh, doing things according to the will of God. And be not conformed to this word, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Is our life still dedicated to God? Do you remember the time that you got saved? We are not Pentecostal, we are not charismatic, but we have emotions. The first time, when, when the time that you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, do you remember that feeling? Do you remember the joy that overwhelmed you? Do you remember that zeal? That when you're a new Christian, you want every day to be Sunday so that you can worship the Lord and you can be with the people of God. That you always think about the Lord Jesus Christ. That you always read the Word of God. That you always talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. But then somehow, it waned. You're not that excited anymore when Sunday comes. You're not that excited anymore to share the Word of God, to share your testimony to the Word. Something happened that deep devotion is not there anymore. You see, we must give everything to God. Amen? Surrender all to God. It means that if we still love God, then we are going to give Him our time. Look at Psalms chapter 90 verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. What is that numbering our days? Meaning to say that our days must count for the Lord. That it must be given to the Lord. That we must be poured out and spent for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when you are in love, nobody can stop you. To be with the object of your love. My father-in-law during that time was very much against me. But he cannot stop me. Even my own pastor was against me. But he could not stop me. Why? Because of that love and that devotion to Sister Maribel. So I divide everybody that will Stop me in loving her. Why? Because of that love that is in my heart. Before, nobody can stop you from going to church. Even your parents, your husband, your wife, your children, nobody. But now you're stopping yourself from going to the church. You're stopping yourself from giving your time to God. You say, I must have time for myself, ladies and gentlemen. Giving our time to God is giving our time for ourselves, for our family, for our job, for our future, for our children. Why? Because time spent with God will never be a wasted time. It is an investment wherein we are going to get the, uh, the profit of that in this world and in the world to come. That's why we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And whenever there is a chance, we should do something for the glory of God. So our time must be dedicated to Him. Our talents must be dedicated to God. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 10. For as much then as Christ... No, the end. Verse 10. As every man that received the gift... Even so, minister the same one to another as good steward of the manifold grace of God. You see, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit has given you a gift. It was given to you so that you can use it for the edification of the body of Christ. But so many Christians, sad to say, are using that gift only for the benefit of themselves. 
you have no right to use that gift to entertain the world. It was given to you to be a blessing to the church, to the local church where you are a part of. And that is so sad. Whenever our talents, our efforts are being poured out into the world and not into the church. You see, sometimes if you're going to treat the, your job like you treated the church, you will be out of work tomorrow. But if you are going to treat the church as important, then you are going to benefit from this. Not only you, but even the people with you and the people that surround you. Why? Because you can be used by God to edify the body as you use that talent. Alam mo, mahirap bida ka sa sanlibutan kontra bida ka sa church. The word is benefiting from you. What? Why? Because of the talent that God has given you, while the very purpose, while it was given to you in the first place for the church, is not benefiting from you. You are misusing the talent that God has given you. You are robbing the church of the gift that God has given to the church so that that church will be edified by the grace of God. We must show our testimony for the glory of God. You see, the son says, All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. Someone has said that service without devotion is rootless. Devotion without service is fruitless. These two must come together. That you are serving because you love God. And you love God, that is why you are serving. Because you can serve without loving God. And when you do that, you are just wasting your time. Amen? Amen? So are we still devoted to God? Do we still have that love in our heart for God? Are we excited? I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Do we still have that excitement? Or sometimes we will wake up in the morning, Oh, is it Sunday? You do not even know that it is a time or the time to go into the house of the Lord. So where's the excitement? Where's the zeal? Where's the expectation? It's not there anymore. Our service has become mechanical, cold, without life. Yeah, we're still doing it like, like a machine. But there is no more devotion involved in it. Are we still defending the faith for the glory of God? By faith, I mean the whole uh, body of revealed truth. Like what was mentioned in Jude verses 3 and 4. That we need to contend for the faith. That we need to see to it that the faith will remain pure by the grace of God. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 to 16. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, until we become matured, then that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, like a church that's immature, that everything is uh, uh, being treated as a big issue, even though they are non-issue, that we are creating divisions instead of working for unity, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sleight of men, that you will open your Facebook and you will read something and then you will be confused because there is no depth in, in our knowledge of the Word of God and cunning practiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even christ from whom whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love so you are important Everyone in the church is important because we are like a, a 
puzzle that is fitted together, that, that is uh, uh, made so that we can see the whole picture. If you remove one, then we will not see the whole picture. And there might be some confusion and there will be weakness in that body. That is why each and every one of us must do something for the preservation of the faith that was once delivered unto us. We need men like Stephen who died proclaiming and defending the truth. Like the Apostle Paul who was in prison so many times. Why? Because of preaching the truth. The whole truth and the whole counsel of God. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ gave a challenging question in Luke chapter 18 uh, part of Luke chapter 18 when he said when the Son of Man come shall he find faith on earth. Just imagine that question. If I will come again, will I ever find faith here on earth? Why? It means that there is going to be a great apostasy. That people will, uh, will be drawn away from the truth. That people will not be itching ears. That they will not endure hearing the truth anymore from the word of God. But they are going to define what is truth according to their subjective mind. You see, sometimes the word of God is not important anymore. What is important now is how we interpret the word of God. There is a great debate going on right now on Facebook. I do not know. Maybe in my circle. At least in my circle. They're talking about tithing. And they abuse words like fools. Like stupid. Like uh, judgmental. And all cruel uh, words to describe one another because they could not agree about the teaching on tithing. And they asked me, Pastor Joel, what is your stand about tithing? I said, I'm practicing free will tithing. But if you are talking about tithing under the law, that's not what I'm doing. Because tithing under the law must be done according to the letters of the law. And I said, I am practicing what Abraham did without any command not manipulated he was not forced there is no element of fear when he did that he did it because that is what he wants to do by showing his love and devotion to Melchizedek during the time and Jacob when he promised that if the Lord will bless him he will give the ten of all the blessing without any command or anything but when it became a law, it was given to Israel, and it must practice according to the letter of the law. And when you try to obey the law, you must obey all the law. Because by not obeying the law, there is a curse. But in Galatians chapter 3, 10 and 13, God has removed the curse. We were bought with a price. We belong to God. Everything that we have given to God must be given out of love and according to the desire of our hearts carefully, not of necessity, not grudgingly, because our God loveth a cheerful giver. But you know what they're fighting about? About what is, how do you redeem your tithes? What is the 20% on top of your tithes if you're going to change it to money? And all the details, when they sometimes agree, but the tithing that must practice is not the tithing under the law. You see, you know what I told them? Just find a common ground and do all your discussions according to your common ground so that you will not be swayed, so that you will not swerve and fight each other while if you will look, if you will analyze it closely, you actually agree with this other. But you know, when pride comes in, it will destroy everything. Amen? That's why we need to do all of these things, even defending the faith with humility and only for the glory of God. Not to show that you are better than them. Not to show that, that your method is better or you know more than them. Why? Because the truth is absolute. You cannot improve on the truth. And you cannot even diminish the truth. You can only proclaim the truth. So do we still defend the faith for the glory of God? Do we still deliver the gospel according to Matthew chapter 28 so that we can lift the Lord Jesus Christ up? Are we still
still involved in missions. Not only involved because we want to be known as a, a church that loves missions, but a church who loves God, that is why we involved in missions. You see? We can support 3,000 missionaries for the accolade, but not for the glory of God. But so that we, I want our church to be known, you see, as a missionary-hearted church. As a church who loves missionaries. But what about as a church who loves God? That's why we love missionaries. That's why we support missionaries. That is why we pray for missionaries. That is why we care for missionaries. Why? Because we love God. And the churches at Ephesus lost that. That's why God said, Thou was loved. Thy first love. You see, look at Psalms 126, verses 5 to 6. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. There is that love. There is that emotion. There is that, that devotion in doing this. We go with the gospel. We go with a broken heart because of the people that are lost. Not only that, but we carry the gospel. We share the gospel and depend on God for the result. And because we depend on God, we will doubtless come back rejoicing, bringing our ships with us. Why? Because when we let God work, then it's go always going to be a successful work. Amen? Amen. But when we try to do our own uh, work or exert our own effort, we will always be disappointed. No, Pastor, I have won 20 souls yesterday. Where are they? <laughs> I do not know. You see, I remember when I was studying in Bible school in, our, in the, uh, the church, the Mountain View Baptist Bible Church, uh, one uh, Friday, there was uh, 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 this, our teacher in evangelism, before our class started, he baptized a uh, a person that he claimed he had won for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then after baptizing that, it did not attend Sunday, and they have not seen that in the church. But one of the members knew of the person that was baptized. And he said, Pastor, I know where he is. If you want to follow him up, you can go there. He said, where? You know the parlor at the corner of uh, Don Greco Street? He's one of the uh, workers of that salon. He is actually gay. But if you will go there, you will see him pretending as a woman. So he baptized that person by his own effort, by his own understanding, by, by easy believism. And then they said, now we have a member out there na nangungulot sa parlor. Why? Because I do not know why we want to help God in His ministry. All we have to do is to obey God and give the result to God. Preach the Word. Let the Holy Spirit convict. Share the Word. Let the Holy Spirit do the saving. Do not manipulate people. Do not deceive people. You, you follow me, Lord, Lord. Thank you, thank you. Because today, because today, I understood, I understood that I'm a sinner and I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. But I'm opening my heart, oh God. I'm opening my heart and I'm accepting you, Jesus. I'm accepting you as my personal professor. Lord. Amen. And then now you are saved. If you die, you will go to heaven. Remember this day. And then that person, okay. I'm saved now. I will remember this day. I remember Brother Tirso, who led an old man to the Lord. And he said, Tatang, like saying, Father, repeat after me. He said, Lord, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. Because today, because today, I understand, O oh God, I understand, O oh God, that I am a sinner, that I am a sinner. That I'm going to that I'm going to hell. But you died 
on the cross for my sins, but you died on the cross for my sin. So I am repenting of my sin, I am repenting of my sin, opening my heart, opening my heart, and accepting you as my Lord and Savior, and accepting you as my Lord and Savior. And tomorrow, because it was Saturday, and tomorrow, I, I promise, I promise that I will go to the church. Oh, oh, no, 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 I cannot promise that, the old man said. I have an appointment tomorrow, so I do not know if I can even attend the church. And that ended everything. You see, let God be God. Let God do his part. And let us only do our part, but let us do it with love. Let us do it with compassion. Let us do it because we love God. Amen? Do we still study the word of God? You know, when you got saved, do you remember the time that you got saved when you first got the co a copy of your, of your Bible? You read it every day. You even ask the pastor, Pastor, where will I start in Genesis or in Matthew? And then most of the pastor will tell you, you start with the book of John. And then after that, go to Matthew and then read the New Testament and then go to the Old Testament or sometimes alternative, alternate and all of these things. And you're so excited. Sometimes every day you can read five, six, seven, eight chapters a day. But now not even seven words a day. And we cannot find time in reading and studying the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot go for one day or for many days without food but we can go for many days or even months without the food for our spirit and that is the word of god we must study the word of god because we need to continually know the person that we love amen are we still determined to be more like the lord jesus christ is he the one that we are emulating? Is he the one that we are following? Or our pursuit is just a pursuit of vanity? So have we lost our first love? I hope not. Because it is very costly. It is very important that if we are going to lose it, then we are going to suffer so many things in life. That's why we will go back to Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, we're going to uh, finish this in just a few more minutes because of uh, lack of time. But God gave the remedy. That's what is, you know, great about God. Amen. He commanded them, and then he accused them, but then he gave them a way of escape so that they can go back to their first love. And this is what God said. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. You see, if you have lost your first love, remember. Pastor, what I'm, am I going to remember? Remember the, time, the, the times that you were in love. Remember the circumstances. Remember the things that, that were happening during that time. Remember that. And then remember the things that you have done or may have happened. Why you drifted away from that love. Remember, go back to that time. Go back. To that place and once you identified it the bible says repent change the course of your life change the direction of your life and go back to the place where you will love god again amen it says remember it says repent and then do the first words repeat the things that you have done when you fell in love with the lord so, Pastor, you want me to be saved again? I'm not talking about that. Because once you're saved, you're forever saved. But how you felt when you got saved. The excitement. The zeal. The desire. Rekindle that. Stir that up. Put more. more you, you find the flame of that love for the Lord. You, you remember, you repent, and then you repeat what you have done. So that you can go back to that situation. Why? Because you see, losing your first love is something that is gradual. It did not happen overnight. You see, when the Apostle Paul says, you need to be careful. Because after I leave, 
uh, uh, false teachers will come in. You know, it happened 35 years. It happened gradually from the, the special of the Apostle Paul to the letter of the Lord Jesus Christ to the church at Ephesus. It was approximately 35 years. So it was gradual. If you can learn to love and then drift away from that love that it waned, you can relearn to love. Amen? It may also be gradual, but you can do it. You have been there. You can go back there. It is not something that is uh, unknown to us. It is something that we know. And if we are going to be honest, we like it while it lasted. Amen? So go back there. So remember, repent, repeat. Why? If we are not going to do that, there will be a removal. Or I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. So it is dangerous. If we will continue this path of drifting away from our first love, then time will come that God will step in and will remove the candlestick and there will be no light in us anymore. We're not going to lose our salvation, but we are going to lose that enthusiasm, that seal, that love, and we are going to regret it when we face the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. Well, it's time we have to stop here. But the question is this. Why are you doing what you are doing right now? Is it because we love God? Or is it because, well, Pastor, it's my duty. It's my responsibility. I have to do it. No. God is more interested in us than in what we can do for him. Let me end with this illustration. There was this father and daughter and the father loved her daughter so much. The daughter was young and almost every day they go for a walk together in the park and that was a grand time for the two of them. But then something happened along the way that whenever the father will ask the daughter for a walk, the daughter will say, oh, Dad, I cannot do it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm busy, I'm doing something. I just cannot do it. And it happened for three months. But then, one day, it was the birthday of the father, and the daughter came to the room of the father, so excited, and gave his father a gift. And when the father opened the box. It was a pair of slippers. And he said, oh, thank you, my daughter, for buying these slippers for me. He said, dad, I did not buy it. So that is what you are doing for three months. Yes, dad, how did you know? Because the dad said, for three months, I'm asking you for a walk. And you always have an excuse. And then the father said, next time, my daughter, just buy me a slippers. Because, you know, your time with me is more important than what you can do for me. In that last three months, I would rather that we go for a walk than for you to make something to make me happy. Does it ever occur to us that what God wants is us, our fellowship, our time with him? than doing things for him, but while doing it, we are not allowing our presence to be with the Lord. And sometimes that is how we lose our first love. The activities are still there. The seal is still there. The fundamentalism is still there. We are still sound. We are still strict. But there is no more devotion. For the Lord Jesus Christ. It became cold and mechanical. So today, if we are like that daughter, why don't we remember, repent, repeat, so that God will not remove 
the joy of salvation in our hearts. Shall we stand up, please? While every heads are bowed, I, uh, I believe that the Lord has spoken to each and every one of us.